In these turquoise blue waters of the Caribbean is an invisible border where U.S. agents chase boatfuls of illegal immigrants and sniff out huge stashes of hidden drugs. It's still the wild west out here, I think. On the water, it's, it's a needle in a haystack at that point. We're on patrol along a southern U.S. border you haven't heard much about. Plenty of fuel, avionics. So if they make it through Puerto Rico, they're home free? Uh, well, basically, yes. The remains of hundreds of illegal immigrants have been found in the Arizona desert. Greg Hess is a sort of death detective who tries to figure out who they were. I guess you can't just assume that's who they are. No, people travel with false identifications or they may have an incentive to use someone else's name uh, even if it's their photo. Two decades of an unusual effort to identify the unknowns. And there's an IRS program offering free professional help to file your tax returns. But guess who's trying to keep it secret? I mean, the main thing to know about this program, which goes back to 2002, is that very few people actually know about it. How millions of taxpayers are missing out. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Atkinson. We begin this year in our new studio, FM1, and a new look. More on that a little later. Today, an examination of a U.S. border that you might not have given much thought to. Like our southern border with Mexico, it's the target of nonstop efforts by drug traffickers, human smugglers, and possibly even terrorists. But this U.S. border is in the Caribbean, and the job of guarding it is arguably even more complicated. Our Caribbean journey begins at the San Juan, Puerto Rico seaport with a ferry that comes in three times a week from the Dominican Republic. It carries up to a thousand passengers and cargo, including vehicles, all getting their last look before entering the U.S. How does that make it easier for smugglers, the fact that Puerto Rico is out here, but it is a U.S. territory? Uh, mainly because containerized cargo leaving Puerto Rico to the U.S. mainland uh, doesn't see customs anymore. They don't see CBP anymore. After oh. this? After this. So we are the last line of defense. Robert Vaccaro is a top border security official here. So if they make it through Puerto Rico, they're home free? Uh, well, basically, yes. The U.S. territory of Puerto Rico, about the size of Connecticut, is about 1,000 miles from the mainland U.S. It's only about 80 miles from the Dominican Republic and Haiti across what's called the Mona Passage. It's also a straight shot from Venezuela and Colombia. That positioning makes it prime territory for drug runners and human smugglers moving illegal products into the U.S. I don't think most Americans think of Puerto Rico as a place that is sort of on the front lines of the war on drugs. It is, it is, and it's very unique. We're in a unique strategic location. It's an easy route for smugglers to actually uh, move their narcotics or any other type of contraband to any secluded beach, uh, maybe to some of the mangroves, uh, maybe to other, uh, other outer ports, other outer uh, sister islands that we have here in Puerto Rico. So it is strategic and also it's, uh, it's considered domestic if you're flying in anything from actually Puerto Rico into the U.S. mainland. So that's a smuggler's dream. This is where U.S. border agents recently seized 311 pounds of cocaine shaped into 122 bricks and hidden in a tank. Drug-sniffing border dogs in Puerto Rico have found boxes from Colombia labeled red roses but containing cocaine valued at more than $700,000. Cocaine has been hidden in shampoo bottles and found inside books and drugs found inside dry erase markers. And while we're here at the San Juan seaport, one of the canines seems to be onto something. So you buckle there, they have a little pole strap right here. Okay. For the bad guys, moving people and drugs carries great risks, as we're about to see. If you think the southern U.S.-Mexico border is challenging, imagine patrolling a border that's nothing more than an invisible line in the ocean, 12 nautical miles out to sea. Um, there's thousands of uh, square miles of, of, of ocean to cover, uh, all the way coming up from uh, Venezuela, Colombia, all the way here to Puerto Rico. Jeffrey Schneeberger is a marine agent with Customs and Border Protection. Anything else you want to say about 
a job or what people ought to know about what happens over here? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's it's still the Wild West out here, I think. On the water, it's, it's a needle in a haystack at that point. It's not a line in the sand that uh, you cross. Uh, a plane can only do so much with that needle in the haystack, and a boat can only do so much. When boats containing drugs or illegal immigrants are spotted, agents coordinate with their partners in the air. Here, air units are watching as agents intercept a Colombian fast boat racing through the Caribbean Sea toward Puerto Rico. Here, they're on to a drug boat from Venezuela. This video shows border agents chasing down a boat carrying three smugglers and 220 pounds of cocaine. Plenty of fuel, avionics, crew passenger equipment. We're on a Customs and Border Protection Black Hawk helicopter. Agents show us a more than 1,000 foot high antenna on the western side of Puerto Rico that smugglers use as a beacon. Then we fly out over the turquoise blue waters to Desacheo Island, a deserted national wildlife refuge. Christopher Columbus landed here on his second voyage to the New World. Today, smugglers charge immigrants three to $6,000 each for a boat ride to get dropped off on one of these treacherous remote islands, hoping to get picked up by U.S. patrols. Officials tell us a lot of illegal cash transfers happen here, too. In the past year, throughout Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, more than 1,400 illegal immigrants were picked up. About a third of them already had criminal histories. In September, a makeshift boat overloaded with 38 illegal immigrants from the Dominican Republic capsized. Three of them drowned. A Black Hawk crew like the one we're with provided surveillance and cover when two men from the Dominican Republic were intercepted in a boat carrying more than 4,000 pounds of cocaine worth $47 million. A U.S. Border Air Team spotted this boat carrying illegal immigrants and tracked it until it was intercepted by the Coast Guard. We wait until dark and head out on a different aircraft, a Dash 8 turboprop plane. Our assignment, to patrol the Mona Passage between the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Due to the sensitive nature of their work, the crew doesn't want us to show their faces. Before long, we spot a suspected drug boat. There's a boat off the Dominican Republic. There's a vessel coming off the Dominican Republic. In November, a plane like ours spotted a boat full of 28 illegal immigrants. It could have capsized and had no real life-saving equipment on board. Boat agents rescued them and learned five of the immigrants had snuck in before. Tonight, our airplane crew that spotted the suspicious boat quickly becomes distracted by immediate concerns. There's a mechanical malfunction with our plane. Left autopilot yield and fail. So now I cannot engage the autopilot. We're getting all sorts of messages here. I'm not around anymore with this. No, I don't want to mess around with it anymore. We end up having to burn off fuel so we can land. So normally if you saw a boat like that and we weren't having a maintenance issue, what would we do? We would definitely go and see if we could get a visual on that. And tonight we just have to let it go. Mechanical malfunctions aren't all that uncommon, they tell us, making their job all the more difficult. <laughs> Back at the San Juan seaport, it turns out the drug-sniffing dog was on to something big. And you can see the, the plastic thing. It's loaded. This one's loaded. It looks like a, uh, like a contraband uh, package. I'm going to put it in our test kit. In the rear brake drums of the Ford van, Customs and Border Protection found six pounds of heroin valued at $162,000. Another big find at this lesser known U.S. border hotspot. So Puerto Rico is a hot point. They don't have to go to customs anymore. So this is their last point. This is actually the last line of defense for anything coming into the U.S. A U.S. border that lies in the Caribbean Sea where there's no chance to build a fence. Officials report a spike in drug seizures in the Caribbean sector. They say when security tightens up on the Mexican border, things become more active there. Ahead on full measure, a grim mystery in the Arizona desert 
inside the forensic efforts to identify remains of hundreds of illegal immigrants. Next. We are approaching the 20th anniversary of a spike in illegal immigrant remains found in the southern Arizona desert. Today we look at a special effort to identify them also entering its 20th year. Dr. Greg Hess has led the effort for the past dozen or so years. He's a forensic pathologist and chief medical examiner for Pima County in Tucson, Arizona. Um, well, this is an example of uh, skeletal remains that uh, you know, we'd find out in the environment that we've been talking about. And the only property that we found with the remains is, um, you know, these pair of shoes, right? When did this come in? Um, this came in this year, um, probably about two months ago. Is there a way to know if it's a man or a woman by yeah. looking at the bones? Yeah. So essentially the pelvis, this is the one of the pelvic bones. So the shape of the pelvis will tell, tell us about 99% of the time if it's a man or a woman. This looks very much like a man. Um, DNA will tell us 100% of the time once we get that result back if the person has a Y chromosome or not. Most of the people over here are unidentified. You know, like that tag is unidentified. So anything that says unidentified or John or Jane. So anyway, we're in the um, we're in the room where we keep some of the property. So this is an example of the stuff that we would keep in these sleeves, right? And we know the person was found in 2019 because the number starts with that. And then stuff like identification cards and money and things that may or may not be distinctive. Remember we talked about distinctive property items. The we belt would, buckle. Yeah, we would have in here. So this is a belt buckle with two kind of crossed guns on it, and it's sort of has some scroll work done to it. So somebody might know this is so-and-so's favorite belt buckle, right? So, and that's just one. I mean, you can thumb through here and see some of these we have identification cards for, um, rings, this wallet. Um, another one, here's a, here was a cell phone that we sent to the, probably sent to the Sheriff's Department to see if they could retrieve information from it. Um, here's a little, Kind of this weathered book, you know, of some kind. Maybe it looks like a little Bible or something that was found with these remains. These. So in the 1990s, we would have a few every year uh, where we would find remains in a desert area, and we believed it to be somebody that's uh, from Mexico or Central America, and they died in the attempt to enter the United States without permission from the government to do so. And then in the year 2000, um, that really jumped up about five-fold from, again, about an average of 15 a year to 70-some a year. And then in 2002, it was 146. And then to just kind of summarize 2002 through the end of last year, 2018, um, we averaged about 150 a year. So we recovered 127 remains last year in 2018 and 90 so far uh, year to date in 2019. There's a little more complication with figuring out sometimes who these people are than normal because if you find a wallet and an ID on that person, I guess you can't just assume that's who they are. No, people travel with false identifications or they may have an incentive to use someone else's name uh, even if it's their photo. Um, a whole host of reasons why people may not use um, the correct ID or some type of identification. What are some typical causes of death that you find? Uh, really, it's exposure. So we would lump um, being too hot, potentially being too cold, and dehydration, which could come in both of those cases into that category. Do you find people who have been murdered, shot? Yeah, we do. Uh, it's not very common. I think it's about 3% of the total number of remains that we've examined. Uh, we're close to 3,000 remains since the year 2000 uh, of this group of people. Um, so it's not, it's not common, but yes, sometimes people do get shot. Looking back when this spike started in 2000, what could you say has been learned through this effort? The way you document where people are located and where they're found has changed. Um, you know, GPS is very prevalent now. So if you look at some of our old location data where remains are found, it would just be a milepost on a road. But we know that that wasn't exactly where those remains came from. Like everybody has a cell phone now, so even if you find remains of somebody you believe to be a migrant, there's often evidence that they had some type of 
electronic device with them, a charging cord or a cell phone, that we can now try to get information from that phone to help figure out who they are, or that wasn't there uh, when this started. So that some of those things have changed. You're a scientific guy. You're fairly non-emotional when you describe these things. But on a human level, what are some of your reflections having worked in this effort for 12, 13 years? Really kind of the emotional aspect is when you do identify someone and then you're in, you are in contact with family members and they are usually uh, quite grateful that there's some kind of resolution has been reached uh, in regards to, you know, somebody they may have been looking for for a long time. If there comes a day um, in the next 10 years and you're still here, and the number of remains found goes way back down again, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a handful instead of 150. What will you think about that? Well, kind of the end of a period of time, right? So I'm sure people will look at this aspect of this wave of migration from um, Mexico and Central America, and it certainly won't last forever, right? So if you look Back in time, it was waves of people from Europe coming to the United States, and now it's not quite that way. So will it be replaced by something else, and how will that look? And um, I'm sure people will write about it in the future, and we'll just uh, declare that period over. Hess's office works with third parties and nonprofits to help connect to family members to see if their loved one has been found. Since the year 2000, more than 3,000 unidentified border crosser remains have been found more than 1,000 are still unidentified. Coming up on Full Measure, there's a free way to get professionals to file your tax returns. So why don't you know about it? Earlier this year, the IRS announced new changes in a program that was supposed to provide free tax preparations to millions, a deal the IRS cut years ago with big tax firms. If they'd offer free help, the IRS agreed not to build its own software to do it. Turns out the free help has been too hard to find and often steered people to paid services. Paul Keel of ProPublica investigated. By way of background, has there been a lot of discussion over the years that the IRS ought to make it easier and provide a free way for people, especially of lower incomes, to file? Yeah, I mean, so this goes back to the 1990s. You know, everybody used to file on paper. Um, and there was a big push to get people to file electronically because the IRS saved a lot of money. Those sorts of proposals have been something that Intuit has viewed as a threat and have tried to stop. What power do companies like Intuit have or TurboTax have to try to prevent something like this? What do they do? Well, they, they have an army of lobbyists. I think we counted this this year. They have over 40 lobbyists on Capitol Hill. You know, they spread their contributions uh, around Congress and also I think they're able to make arguments that people find persuasive in part because the IRS is not a popular agency. So they're able to make arguments like, do you want the IRS you know, preparing your taxes and also auditing you? On its face, it sounds like a good thing that TurboTax and Intuit would come up with a program to let you file for free if you go to their website under certain conditions. But it sounds like you're saying that sort of a end run around the notion of really making it easier and free for people. Right. Well, I mean, the main thing to know about this program, which goes back to 2002, is that very few people actually know about it. So last year, under 3 million people used this program, which is you have to find it's sort of like a secret door on the IRS's website. It's the, called the Free File Program. And if you make it to that page and then you file a link back to TurboTax, then you'll absolutely have a free uh, tax return uh, filing. Uh, both federal and state is what they're offering right now. But very few people find that secret door. One reason for this is that Intuit and H&R Block have these free offers that they make people. So if you Google on the internet, free tax prep, what's going to come up usually is like TurboTax and H&R Block saying, hey, free. Um, but it's, it's a marketing ploy. Both Intuit and H&R Block um, stopped Google from indexing their pages because they didn't want people, if you Googled free tax prep, they didn't want the government program coming up. How can they stop Google? Um, you can you can put language on like you know basically code on your website that says Google no don't read this. Were you able to find out how many people do use the free program that's available through the IRS? So it's under three million people, which uh, hundred million people are eligible, you know supposedly, um, but no more than five million have ever used it in the whole history of the program. Uh, but nevertheless, the IRS claims it's a successful program. Can you quantify how much that industry, the tax filing industry, spends on lobbyists? lobbying and political contributions? I think we totaled was over $30 million that Intuit has used on, uh, spent on, you know, lobbying over the last uh, decade or so. 
Um, it's an enormous return on an investment given you know the billions of dollars that that, that they've made in profit. Um, so it's you know it's a good investment. Can you tell is whether one party, political party, or another political party is sort of pushing? You know, a lot of times it's one against the other. Well, they've spread around their money pretty well in Congress, and they've gotten bills introduced uh, by both members of both parties. One study found five of 12 companies that partnered with the IRS used coding that hid their free services from many online searches. Next on Full Measure, President Trump promised to donate his White House salary. We follow the money. You may remember President Trump pledged to donate his entire $400,000 presidential salary. So we check to see where the money's gone. So far, it's all been given to taxpayer-supported federal agencies. For example, Trump gave $100,000 of his salary for research at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse. The president doesn't drink, but is often referred to his brother Fred, dying of alcoholism-related causes back in 1981. In 2017, the president donated his salary to the National Park Service and the Departments of Education, Health and Human Services, and Transportation. In 2018, it was the Veterans Administration, the Small Business Administration, National Institutes of Health, and Homeland Security. In 2019, the Agriculture Department, Surgeon General, and most recently, the Assistant Secretary of Health, earmarked for the opioid crisis. Other presidents who donated their entire salaries were John Kennedy and Herbert Hoover. Next week on Full Measure... Fearing potential violence, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam declared a state of emergency earlier this year and banned weapons on the ground of the Capitol as the legislature considered new gun restrictions. How critics responded statewide with their own movement to protect the Second Amendment. The law-abiding gun owners will not go quietly into the night. 2,000 citizens on their own have come out here at night to declare the sacrosanct rights which they were born with. And before we go with this first program of the new year, we've said farewell to our old studio and are ringing in brand new digs here at Full Measure. We spent the past week putting the final touches on things, including a new high-definition video wall to keep it fresh for you. If you're keeping count, we're midway through our season five. Happy New Year, everybody. We look forward to seeing you throughout 2020 as we search for more stories that hold powers accountable. See you next week.